Good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome to this webinar, uh, wherever in the world you are dialing in from. We are all saddened that the 2020 Structural Awards have had to be cancelled due to COVID-19, but all the submissions have been showcased, and hopefully a much wider virtual audience will benefit from this um, session with three of the judges, including the panel chair, um, and they will be providing a look behind the scenes at the process and the judging of the awards. My first pleasant duty is to introduce the panel and say a little bit about them. We start with uh, Tanya de Hoog. She's a founding director of uh, Thornton Tomasetti's London office. Her professional experience spans Europe, the Middle East, Southeast Asia and Australia, where she has worked on a diverse range of projects that focus on engineering creativity and innovation with an intent to foster good design. Celebrating the contributions structural engineering can bring to society, as well as, the, as well as promoting the importance of continued education and the application of sound engineering principles and their relevance to emerging technologies are very important to Tanya. And uh, she has been a member of the Structural Awards judging panel since 2017. Ian Firth, as you know, is a world leading expert in bridge design and construction. During his career, he has been involved with world famous bridge projects like the strengthening of the Severn Bridge, the Erskine Bridge and the West Gate Bridge and the concept design of Stonecutters Bridge in Hong Kong as well as many smaller pedestrian bridges, such as the new Inner Harbour Bridge in Copenhagen and the Taplow Bridge near Maidenhead. He is also a leading advocate and trustee of the bridge building charity called Bridges to Prosperity. Ian is also a past president of the Institution of Structural Engineers. He was president in 2017, and he has been a member of the Structural Awards judging panel since 2007. Uh, Tim Eibel was president of the institution in 2015 and he is a fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering. He has a passion for celebrating creativity within our profession and for using this creativity to inspire students. Tim has been professor of structural engineering at the University of Bath since 2003 including a year's interlude as the Sir Kirby Lang Professor of Civil Engineering at the University of Cambridge in 2017 and 18. Uh, Tim has been chairman of this uh, Structural Awards judging panel since 2018. Let me just explain the format. Each panel member will speak on a key issue to begin with. Then I will put several questions to the panel members in turn and finally, the floor will be open to questions from the audience. To keep this as seamless as possible, um, Tim is going to talk first uh, and hand over to Ian without any intervention from me. And Ian is then going to hand over to Tanya. So, Tim, it's my great pleasure to hand over, you, over to you to begin the proceedings this afternoon. OK, so uh, thank you, Don, very much. I have the very... Uh, pleasant task of talking about the, the Structural Awards and what it looks like in 2020, uh, which of course is different to what we would normally be doing. Right now we would normally be getting ready to put our penguin suits on to sit in um, uh, in the brewery in, in London and have a wonderful celebratory ev event. Times are different, so how are they different? What changes have we had to make this year? What we have, what we decided right back in, in March, April was to move the 2020 entries to be considered formally in 2021, uh, as it were, in a bumper crop next year. Um, this, as it turns out, now that we are in lockdown in the UK, it turns out to have been a good decision. That's luck. We were concerned, of course, that they, we were always going to be vulnerable. Um, and so it turns out to have been a good decision. What we wanted to put in place uh, was a separate celebration for the 2020 entries on the basis that waiting a whole year to be judged just didn't feel right or proper. And so we are running a people's vote this year, which I'll talk about a little later, 
um, for the 2020 entries to celebrate them um, in, a, in a different way, but nonetheless a celebration. Okay, so who are we? These are the 20 through, 23 fabulous mugshots of all of the judges um, on the panel. And the categories, what I'm going to do is I'm going to charge through the categories that we have for the Structural Awards. Um, there are two new categories this year, which I'll, I'll pause on um, a little later, but I'm, I'm going to move through each of these quite quickly, just to get give you a flavor of the sorts of things that we look for. So the first award um, is for tall or slender structures, which are awarded for structural engineering excellence in projects where height or slenderness presents a particular structural challenge in the design and construction. And there's an image of a previous winner. All the images I'm going to show in these categories are all previous winners of these categories. So the second one is the long span structures, award for long span structures, awarded for structural engineering excellence in buildings, specifically in operators, incorporating particularly long spans relative to the proportions of the structure. And then we have two awards for bridges. The first one is vehicle bridges, awarded for excellence in the design of bridges carrying highways or railways. And then, of course, the equivalent for pedestrian bridges, awarded for excellence in the design of pedestrian and or cycle bridges or other lightweight bridge structures. Then we have a very popular category, a remarkably popular category, small projects, awarded for excellence in the structural design of projects with a construction cost of less than less than three million pounds. We had the award for structures in extreme conditions awarded for excellence in the design of structures subject to extreme actions or involving unusually complex interactions with the ground and or particularly challenging foundations. And then we have another very popular uh, category, structural heritage awarded for excellence in structural design where important heritage characteristics of the original structure are maintained through appropriate restoration and conservation. And another equally popular category every year, structural transformation, awarded for projects demonstrating structural engineering excellence in the transformation or extension of an existing building or structure. Another very popular uh, category is construction innovation, awarded for projects demonstrating structural engineering excellence in the innovative use of construction materials or processes. And then we have two awards for structural artistry. The first one is structural artistry in building structures. So awarding for, awarded for projects in which an otherwise adequate solution has been transformed by the vision and skill of the structural engineer to something exceptional. And then we have the equivalent for the non-building structures. So the example on the screen is, is a sculpture, of course. So this is awarded for unusual structures, excluding buildings, in which the skill of the structural engineer has been paramount. Structures may include sculptures, demonstrated projects, motorway gantries, floating structures, and so on. This, again, is a very popular uh, category. And then the first of two new categories. Um, this is zero carbon. This is a new category. Let me give you a little bit of background. Those of you who have entered the awards before will know that we in the past have had an award for sustainability, which the judges have, have looked at in terms of all of the projects put forward in any particular year. We choose a sustainability project, a sustainability winner. We decided this year that we would change that and we would have a specific category, which is zero carbon, because that is where our profession needs to position itself. It is in that in that, this new era of zero carbon. So this award is awarded for projects which demonstrate zero or negative carbon design in both the embodied carbon in the structure and the operational requirements of the project. And another new award, I always joke about this one, it's the award for doing nothing. It's not quite, it's the award for minimal structural intervention. It's awarded to the projects, if before I read the words, it's awarded to projects and to structural engineers who have sat down with their clients and together with, by using their expertise, have managed to prevent major intervention. So in the past, all of our awards have always had imagery of some major intervention from a structural engineer. Well, this award celebrates, as I said previously, frankly, doing nothing but that doesn't mean that there is no thought or expertise. That is exactly 
how it was possible to do minimal intervention. So I'll read the words, awarded for projects, which through the ingenuity of structural engineering expertise have led to, to no or minimal structural intervention in order to safely prolong the life of an existing structure. And finally, the 14th award is the Supreme Award, the one which always causes major discussion around the table, fabulously. It's for the finest example of excellence in structural engineering design selected by the judges from the previous 13 winners of the principal awards categories. So what do we look for? Something which we always get asked. We look for five things. The first one is sustainability. Now the wording in sustainability this year has been beefed up significantly for all the correct reasons. So we look for innovation in material choice. We look for a positive impact on society with particular reference to the UN SDGs and to the circular economy principles. We look now for quantification of the embodied carbon footprint of the structure, not necessarily the whole project, it's the aspects of the, of the project which, over which the structural engineer has full control. Um, and and you, anybody can use any name counting scheme they like. Of course, we would prefer if you use the Institution of Structural Engineers how to calculate embodied carbon document, but you can use any one you like. Um, and we require commentary on how the embodied carbon was minimized. So these are stronger now. Those, those words are stronger than they used to be for sustainability. In creativity and innovation, we look for examples of originality and the application of new and improved technologies and processes. Creativity, you put the sustainability for the first point and you put creativity second. These are our core things we look at. We look at elegance. We want to see good detailing, engineering structures that demonstrate technical and or visual elegance, including in the attention to detail. Value, always an issue. Economic viability and value for money in a structural solution, as well as non-financial indicators of value. And finally, constructability. Um, so characteristics that place the structural engineering solution well beyond the ordinary, including demonstrable, ex demonstrable examples of how the structural design enabled the project to meet or exceed the client's expectations. So that's what we look for. So this year, the people's vote, the, the, the entries have come in. We're going we're gonna to hold the entries over for, if you like, the official um, uh, judging process in 2021. But we are also doing a people's vote. This opened within the last 24 hours. Have a look online. Please, please engage with it. What we've done is we've taken all of the entries and we've divided them up quite neatly as it turns out, into four piles. There are four areas which we think that all of the entries fit in rather nicely. And so I'm going to go through each of the four and show some imagery of the, um, of the projects that have been submitted and which we have put into each of the categories. So the four categories are achieving architectural vision. And the imagery which I'm showing here is, I need to make this point, this is a selection of some of the projects and those of you watching this, you might recognize your project in this. Um, it's a selection of some of the projects that have come forward, which we have decided to put into this particular category, achieving architectural vision. There are lots of images which I am, I'm not showing here. I've tried to make the images big and therefore fewer of them uh, in order so, so that everybody can see the imagery. Um, so forgive me if your image is not here. It's, there's nothing sinister about that. Everything is still on the website everything will still be judgeable with your with all images and all entries on the website. So the first one is achieving architectural vision. The second one is challenging construction, where construction has driven the design predominantly. And here are some images of those entries, which we have put into that category. I will repeat, this is a very small selection of those entries. Then we've got creative design, and I'll hover there for a second for you to look at some of the creativity that our profession can offer. And finally, sustainable leadership, very important to us. Um, and here are some images of projects which have been put forward, which we have put into this category of showing real leadership in sustainability, um, particularly against uh, the area in which we're in. So that's those are the four categories. So my final slide is, and is to urge you, please, all to engage. Terribly important, please. Please do engage with, um, with this process. Have a look online. Have a look at all those categories. 
Place your vote, please. We are all used to an election at the moment. Please, please, please put your vote in. Um, engage with this process. And if you're considering applying next year, please go ahead and apply next year. Your, um, your entry will be greatly appreciated. So I'm going to stop there. Um, um, I'm going to hand on to Ian. Ian's going to be talking about the, the changes to, uh, to the structured awards over the years. Ian, if I can seamlessly pass to you, please. Good. Thank you, Tim. I hope you can see this and hear me. Um, again, I'm going to assume, unless somebody shouts at me, uh, that yes, that is the case. Yes, we can hear you, Ian. Um, very, very good, Tim. Thank you. So, yes, so going, going seamlessly on, um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about you know, where we've got come from. Um, I think Tyler in a, in a little while will be talking about where we're going. So um, it all started back in 1968, and um, there were just two winners. Actually, the Seven Bridge, was, which was completed in 1966, was, was named initially as the winner. Uh, but then the, the, the celebration included two structures, the ones you see in front of you. And there was a big party with the Duke of Edinburgh, 400 guests and so on, back in March 1968. So that's where we've come from. And back in those days, there were very few... Um, awards given, only a handful, two or three a year. Uh, so back in the 1960s and 70s, there were projects like these um, which uh, were winning uh, what were called the Structural Special Awards. Just a handful of projects each year, sometimes none. And um, it really wasn't until um, uh, some, some years later that things began to, to pick up. Uh, in 1986, uh, they added the, the heritage uh, element, so we had a specific heritage award, which has become popular very ever since, as, as Tim said. So here's another two 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 structures, and so just very briefly, um, there you are. This is also a timeline. The sustainability topic, which we think of as such an important issue now, particularly you know aiming at that zero carbon focus, which is such an important thing for us now in this sort of climate crisis in uh, time. And back then, it was not even thought about, really, and it wasn't until 2000 that we started to really address the sustainability thing. And we had a, a thing called the David Allsop Sustainability Award uh, specifically introduced. Now, of course, every project is looked at with a sustainability lens. In 2003, we introduced the Supreme Award because by this stage, we had started to get a number of projects coming through. Um, and, and then come 2005, uh, we did a major review, and, and basically that sort of created the format that we've now got used to with a number of different categories and so on, um, and, and that was that was back then in 2005. It was really only then that we started having the different categories. And those categories then were, uh, as we'll come to in a second, uh, about what the buildings were being used for rather than perhaps anything specific about the structure. Um, and so in 2016, we had a a big review and we changed the categories around about then and that changed not only the categories but also one or two other things the judging process that was when we introduced a two-stage judging process to make it even more um, uh, easy to identify the fact that there was no um, uh, um, bias in in the judging uh, and then now in this final you know as you've just heard uh, we are concentrating on the zero carbon. If you're interested in any of that, there's a paper there from David Nethercott which says a lot of that stuff, uh, which is really interesting stuff. So anyway, um, early 2000s, you know, we get projects like this. So this is from Arab uh, and, and Grantmai and a beautiful um, pedestrian bridge in, in Holland. Um, really quite clever stuff, uh, obviously recognizing here the skill of the designers um, uh, in, in a number of different uh, aspects. Some small projects, and again, I want to emphasize here that this is not just the big projects. Going back to those early ones, it was indeed very big projects that tended to be winning because these were the things that really stood out in people's minds. But now you have projects of all sorts of scales. And um, here's a, a, a delightful little project in Costa Rica in, in timber. And of course, we also have very large structures. This is an extraordinary use of, of timber, actually um, acting with, with sort of almost compositely with steel in, in, uh, in Canada. So fabulous piece of work by Fastnet from 2009. Another timber, stru timber structure, actually. I just realized I put three timber structures next to each other in this little snapshot. Just a few examples of some of the, the excellent structures that we find and, and, and win um, projects. Materials, of course, are always important. And this was an extraordinary design from Ecclesia Callahan that came through and won actually the Supreme Award uh, in 2014. 
some people said, Where, well, why? What's it? What's so clever? What's the, where's the structure? And of course, the structure is the glass, um, seamless, um, no connections. So it's all structural silicon, carbon fiber, flat roof. Um, this is in a seismic zone. The connections around the edges and so on, absolutely brilliant piece of work. And I think one of the things that really stood, made this stand out was the way that the designers at Eckersley Color had worked with the manufacturers of the glass to make this possible. These, these 10 by 3 meter size panels, which at that stage were just unheard of previously. Lovely little structure down in, in Africa over a, uh, an archaeological site, touching the ground very lightly. They weren't allowed to have any foundations. So really very clever, imaginative way of dealing with that. Another little small project. This is one of the small projects which we see. This is a beautiful post-tension staircase by Webb Yates. So these are just a few examples. And in that 2016 review, we had a look at the, 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 the projects that had been in the sort of recent, the previous sort of five or six years, and, and uh, we looked at where the popular ones were. And you can see there the small projects were getting more and more popular. We were getting lots of those. Uh, and this was, of course, because that's where a majority of our members are, are occupying, are, are working. It's all very well, the big firms who do the big projects. But actually, we're getting a lot of smaller projects coming through. And so at this point, we actually changed the, uh, the criteria slightly. Um, and change from um, uh, the categories, which, as you see here, the buildings, they had um, their, their function, arts or entertainment, commercial or retail, community or residential. And we changed that into um, the, the, the ones that you've just been hearing from, from Tim, the, the slightly earlier version, tall or slender structures, long span structures, and so on. Something which, which actually speaks to the, the skill of the engineers specifically. And of course, across all of those, we had the sustainability, the best value, and the supreme awards. That's all changed now to the latest version. But I just wanted to show you this chart very briefly. So this is just an analysis of four years worth of data at that back at that time. And what I just want to draw, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but I'm going to draw your attention to the top left here, where you can see a red square, which is indicating that there's um, uh, nine companies, nine companies that submitted just one entry and they had a 100% success rate. So they submit one entry in those four years, and that one entry won an award. So that's a 100% success rate. Even more impressive next to it is a company, one company, that submitted two projects in those four years and also had a 100% success rate. So their two projects both won. And even more impressive is the one where, just a bit to the right, hopefully you can see my mouse, somebody submitting four projects in those four years, and every one of them a winner, 100% success rate. Over on the right-hand side here, you see a company that has submitted 34 projects, right at the right-hand side, over the four-year period, but their success rate is 32% or 33%, whatever that number is, so rather lower. And these companies to the right of the screen, these are all the big firms, because, of course, they have a lot of projects. And so they've got lots of potential candidates. So they put them all in. They've got a, probably a whole department that's, that's working on this. But their success rate is relatively low. The ones with the higher success rates tend to be the smaller firms. Very interesting. Um, anyway, that's just something which you might be interested in. We could always revert to that if you're interested. And the next chart is exactly the same, but including the commendations that some companies get. So in that case, there were 10 successful, really successful firms doing that, um, getting their, t their 10 wins. Anyway, so that's just an example. And then, so since then, uh, we've been moving on and some, some more wonderful structures, which we've been hearing from. So here's an example of a award for structural transformation, of course, the Design Museum in, in London by our, love this project. This is a small um, a cricket pavilion in Rwanda from a company called Light Earth Designs. I love it when we get firms applying. We've never heard of them before. And they've got this beautiful little project and they submitted in and it's an absolute gem really really clever skill involved this one you've just seen actually this was this lovely suspension bridge where the the the, the solution was to do very little uh, but only when uh, after the engineer had spent a lot of time working out how little they needed to do really clever stuff so these are the categories going forward uh, and we've, we've just heard about that and i'm really excited to see the zero carbon and mineral structural intervention uh, categories now because that has to be the way we're headed so who's going to win next year who knows we'll find out um so that's all from me um i'm going to hand over to 
Tanya, I'm going to stop sharing and escape from my presentation. And hopefully, Tanya, you can uh, seamlessly continue. Um, so I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes exploring ideas of what changes we might see or perhaps create for ourselves as a profession moving forward. And how might that change be reflected in the awards? So um, we're living in this moment where it's clear that no one can predict the future. But for me, um, because of that, I guess I find it um, easy to look at what are some of the constants that we know about um, in order to think about, okay, well, um, what might the future hold in terms of things we can predict and things that we really, really can't. So I started by reminding myself about the essence of what we do and why we do it. And, and I think these three contributions that you see on the screen provide a nice summary, as they certainly did for me. For me, so as structural engineers, we're guardians of public safety. We, we're creative problem solvers who bring demonstrable value to society. So regardless of this kind of ever-changing future, I believe that these are necessary constants for us. And as an institution, it's also helpful to remind ourselves of what it does. So we uphold standards, uh, we share knowledge, we promote structural engineering, and we create community. So in the con context of our profession and the institution, we're reminded today that we have the Structural en Engineering Awards in order to highlight projects and designs that promote the profession, to celebrate the role and the value of the structural engineer in society. Um, but for me, I think where I get most excited is that these awards promote and stimulate technical excellence and encourage creativity and innovation and inspire current and future generations of structural engineers through their work. So these are constants that are the values we hold true. And for me, I guess I believe that um, we need to change, but we also need to kind of celebrate our role and the contributions that we make through our profession in society. So that's who we are today, and I think that's really exciting. And we've seen, you know, we've seen some really exciting projects in the past and current uh, 2020. But who do we want to be in the profession, and what might change for us to get there? And really, how might we promote and celebrate this through the awards, the awards? And I think they're really interesting questions. I don't necessarily have the answers, but I thought I would um, offer some thoughts about where we might be going. For example, um, what do future guardians of public safety look like? One of the known unknowns, and possibly I think the most important for all of us, is cli the climate emergency. So how do we become guardians of planetary health? And how might the projects we award in the future reflect this? Um, as we work this out and accelerate our involvement, I suspect we'll see this reflected in projects and how they're awarded. Another known unknown is the increasing global population and the impact on the built and natural environment. So there's plenty for us to do as engineers moving forward, but how might our role as guardians of public safety be impacted by this? I started to think about how do we ensure that we become contributors to harmonious societal conditions through our work? And how do we align the awards in the future in order to sort of further and promote this endeavor? And will this impact our moral and professional obligations? And then therefore, how do we, how do we kind of recognize that type of success through the awards? So it could be, and these are just some of the ideas that I've been thinking about as we think about the future. It could be that we use broader criteria and, and Tim alluded to, to um, the fact that we're already looking to a number of sort of more recent criteria in the awards. Um, and so it could be that we use broader criteria and diversify the way that we measure success and the contribution of the engineer. Um, but do we also start to explore diversity through additional methods? For example, do we start measuring the value that we bring to our projects to society? Or perhaps it's that we start to measure net positive actions and impacts on the environment and humanity, or maybe it's even looking at the legacy of and long-term impact of our projects on humans and the environment, as well as projects that just have 
immediately been completed. So we don't know what the future holds, but there are values inherent to the definition of who we are that remain true and needs essential to the survival of the planet and humanity that are necessary for us to contribute to. And I think this is really exciting. And I guess all this to say, if nothing else, it's probable that we will diversify. Um, I took Tim's um, slides and put them together for the 2020 entry. So again, um, I don't believe that this is all of the entries, but I'm not sure. I just took Tim's great work and thought that I would um, uh, use it to demonstrate that what I see just in one year in this current moment is such diversity in the projects that have been submitted from the sort of the size of them, the scale, the geography, materiality function, old, new, you name it. And this is exactly what we want. But personally, one of the things I don't believe we celebrate enough is the people that are impacted by our projects and the people behind them. So I wonder, do we award the people who drove the project or diverse teams who bring the whole profession forward as we move into this future? I certainly think as judges, we'll further diversify and we have a lot, just even in the time that I've been involved. Um, but we need, we need to embrace that and bring those different perspectives and experience and values. And I also want, wonder whether we might continue to um, to celebrate and award success and coll through collaboration. So we have these really big challenges ahead of us and they need collaboration and knowledge sharing um, for all of us to move forward as an industry. So do we start to award projects that reflect that? Or perhaps as we diversify our role as an engineer in a more interdisciplinary way, do we award projects that show the structural engineer as the leader of these teams? Or it might be that we um, give more importance to the tools we use for innovation and creativity as we move forward. So I think whatever the future holds for us as a profession, I believe it's likely that these constants are the values that we hold true, the ones that you see on the screen. These are the things in the Structural Engineering Awards that I don't think will change because they define who we are and what we do and promote um, our role in the profession in society. But I do believe that we'll see greater diversity in every sense. And I think we have an opportunity to further promote the role of the engineer as an essential role in society. Thank you. So I'll hand back to uh, Don now. Thank you very much, panel, for that um, very useful introduction to the process and um, all that's involved in it. Um, I, I now I'm going to pose to each of you uh, what what can be called a myth buster question in other words a common misconception um and just a reminder that you have about three minutes each in which to answer the allocated question so ian we're going to pick on you first please first misconception is that only large companies win uh, well, I hope I actually sort of addressed that in my presentation. So I hope I'm going to take less than three minutes on this one uh, because it's absolutely not true. Um, and uh, as you saw, there was on that chart I showed you, I, don't, I won't bring it up again, but at the right hand side, there was a firm, one of the bigger companies, um, very popular. I'm not going to mention the name, 34 um, in that four year period, 34 entries, and they had a 33% success rate. That's a pretty good success rate, actually, but a lot of work to produce 34 entries. So the fact is that the big companies obviously have a lot of potential projects simply because they're doing a lot of them. But actually, if you look at the data, the smaller companies that tend to put a little bit, I, I mean, I say this carefully, but I think they tend to put a lot of heart and soul into their entries, um, they, they tend to be really quite successful. And we saw there's 100% success rates and very high success rates, often from the smaller firms. And I would say one thing, we saw, we have seen it for years and years and years, and I've been doing this for a long time, we see the difference between entries that have been prepared by the team who actually did the project, by the engineers who really know what they're talking about, as compared to the entries that are submitted by the public relations department or the press office or whoever they are, whose job it is to push out award entries. Not saying they don't do a good job, but the difference is tangible. And I think it's the former is very much more successful on balance. Thank you, Ian. Tanya, can we move to you that. next, please? Um, 
some, some people think that it's only experienced engineers and those with fellow status should apply. Would you like to address that one, please? Sure. Um, so I think hopefully I, um, I touched on that um, in the slides that I just presented in that um, I, I couldn't provo promote diversity enough. And I think when we were talking um, in this panel before, before when we were sort of discussing what, what might we talk about, I think we all felt that diversity is really key. And you can certainly see that in not only the submissions from 2020, but if you look historically as well, it's kind of, it's much richer if we get that diversity. And that diversity comes from um, all different perspectives and um, geographic re regions and type of project. And that needs everybody. And so we really do celebrate the thoughts and the contributions of everybody. The minimum requirement um, is that a member that's been involved in the project must sign off on it. And we are, remember, um, promoting technical excellency and technical competency. So that's really important. Um, but that's the sort of minimum requirement. And my personal view, I guess, is that you can, you can see projects that stand out. I think, from my experience, possibly more of the small to medium sized projects, where you can see the ambition um, and the new thinking that comes from um, people that perhaps are um, younger or, or have less experience in the industry, but um, have these kind of new ideas of, you know, well, why can't we do it that way? And, and that's really what we want. We want everyone to push all of us forward as a profession. Thank you, Tanya. I, I suspect, um, well, I know, Tim, that you've partially covered this one as well, but some people feel that it's only new build projects that will triumph. Well, unsurprisingly, Don, I'm I'm going to disagree with that uh, with that comment, as you would imagine I would. Um, the evidence for that is that we have categories devoted specifically to refurbishment projects. So, as I said earlier, there's the heritage project, the heritage category, I should say, the structural transformation uh, category, and then also the new minimal intervention category to prolong the life of our infrastructure. But probably. Rather than just look at the individual categories which are related not to new build, it's also worth mentioning projects which are not new build, which have won in, and, and have been shortlisted in the last few years. And so immediate examples, I can think of churches, I can think of, of a silo, um, I can think of basements in a very famous hotel in the centre of London. Um, what else can I think of? There, there, are, there are several projects. The, the reconstruction of Christchurch, um, and all of the buildings which they try to save as much as possible from the buildings. Um, there, are, there are significant numbers of awards which have been made outside of those specialist categories um, in favour of projects which have reused our existing infrastructure. Good, thank you. Let me pose another question to each of our panel members. So, Ian, if you don't mind, first again, what are you personally looking for in an entry report? That's a really good question, Don. I'm, I'm very glad you asked it. Um, as I said earlier just now, I mean, what, the difference between somebody who really knows sort of the design uh, and written, has written that down has somehow crystallized the key issues. Um, you know, that's what we're looking for. If, if, if you get that in the, in the submission and not just all the kind of general blurb about how wonderful it is, you know, that's what we're looking for. So why is it special? What makes it structurally special? Not just, you know, beautiful bit of architecture or something. So we want to know what is it that makes it special? Um, what were the processes that the design team went through? How, what, was the, what was the interaction with the client like? How did we really be sure that we've actually met the client's needs or rather exceed, exceeded their expectations and aspirations? You know, it's not just here's a project, you know, this is what it looks like, this is how big it is, and you know, and, and aren't we wonderful? You've really got to unpack for the judges who've obviously got a lot of judges to look at uh, projects to look at. The judges need some help, so you need to really unpack for the judges what is it that's so special about it. And of course, we're looking for the sustainability credentials, that's going to be absolutely critical and indeed essential going forward. You know, you're just not going to win if you don't tick the sustainability box. I think we can say that absolutely categorically now. It's such an important issue. 
that we've got to address that. That's not to say that every project is going to be a zero carbon project because that's actually just not feasible. But it, you know, maybe one day it will be. Um, but but actually, you know, we've got to hit that. We've got to look at the construction issues and so on. So so put it all down. Make sure we can see it. Make sure it's clear. Um, and one final thing, if I may briefly, uh, Don. Um, sometimes people submit drawings which are just the drawings, the standard drawings that they've produced for the contractor to build from. And the fact is that those drawings have got far too much detail on. You need to, you need to work on the drawings to make them submit, you know, for the submission so that the judges can see what's important particularly. I'm not interested in the weld sizes, <laughs> you know, or the bolt, that bolt sizes. Yeah. Um, that's important. Yeah, thanks for that response, Ian. Uh, Tanya, if I could go to you next again, please. In view of the fact that we're having an amalgamated event in 2021, I suppose some might be wondering, have the 2020 entries been actually judged yet? Would you like to respond, please? Sure, sure. So interestingly, um, no, they definitely haven't been judged yet. But um, actually, when Tim sent his slides ahead of this presentation to the panel, that was the first time I'd seen any of the entries. <laughs> so we're all seeing them at the same time, apart from you know a few select people internally who have been organizing today and um, the people's vote. Um, so it is really exciting to be seeing some of them with you, but no, um, they're all being moved to 2021. Um, so can't wait. I think it's going to be a bumper year. Um, and again, we would really encourage everyone to think about submitting, particularly what we're hoping is in giving us insight, it might encourage more people to feel that it's accessible um, for everybody. Thank you for that response. And Tim, this is one that I often wonder about personally. Uh, it's quite important, I suppose. How do we avoid conflict of interest? Okay, thanks, Don. I get asked that a lot as well. Um, it, the best way to answer that is to is to go back in history a little bit. Um, it used to be that there was a single meeting where all of the, the the projects were all looked at in one meeting, and if there was any any conflict of interest for a, for a juror, the juror would leave the room um, all in one day. The, there was there were the, the questions were always asked: Is that a fair process? Um, it's very simple, I think, when you sit on the inside and you see what goes on to make the comment, yes, it's fair, take my word for it. But I completely, 100% understand that people want something more than that. Um, and, and the perception is incredibly important that we're doing the right thing. And so a few years back, when Ian led the review of the, um, of, of the structural awards, it was decided to turn it into a two-stage process so that we would have the, um, to, to begin with, we would have the shortlisting meeting, and then we would have the winners meeting. And what that transpired into in the last couple of years was that we had, um, at, the, at the shortlisting meeting, we would do as we ever did before, which was to ask people to leave the room when, they, when their projects came up. Um, but then for the winners meeting, we didn't invite any member of the jury who had any conflict of interest in any of the shortlisted projects across all of the categories. And you probably can begin to spot the flaw in that because we were thin on the ground with jurors um, when it came to deciding on the winners because we, I think, well, I, that's not I think, I know we went too far the other direction. And so for this year, what we had been planning to do and still we are still planning to do for next year is to have a single meeting, but in advance of that single meeting, we will ask probably up to more or less five jurors who are completely unconflicted to look at certain categories in, for which there is no conflict whatsoever to supply scores. Those scores will define collectively the shortlist. So there is no discussion about the shortlist. The shortlist is done in a numerical judging in a numerical judging manner. We then meet for the single meeting. At that single meeting, Judges will be asked to leave the room while the winners are, are decided. That's what that meeting is for. And at the end of the afternoon to decide on the Supreme Award, all conflicted judges will be asked to go back to Barbican Station and leave the premises uh, if we are there for the rest of the meeting uh, while the 
while the winners are, are decided. So we have a halfway house between where we were and where we want to be. There is no right answer to this. It's a real engineering problem that there isn't a right answer. Um, but we are, we are desperately keen to avoid the perceptions that things are not fair. Um, and that's what, that's our goal all the time to, to, to balance pragmatism with overcoming what I believe to be in, incorrect perceptions. Thank you very much for that response. Um, there are a few questions trickling in now in the open forum, but um, so what I'm going to do, um, Tim, is read out the question, essentially relaying it to yourself. Um, you can decide uh, which of the panel members should field it. Is that okay? Okay, That's so the, fine. the first question is from Chris Shaw, and I suppose it's a very obvious one. How, how are the judges chosen? Ooh, that's a very good question. Ian, can I pass to you for that one, if I may? I'm not really passing, but because you went, because you led the review. So if I may. Well, actually, interestingly, I, I, I can't answer the question um, other than to say um, that this is, you know, I've, I've been on the panel for a long time. I get an invitation from the institution. Um, I think what's happened is that each year we try to have a, a, a turn. So there's some new people, new faces that join. Uh, but of course, we also want some continuity. We want people who've been doing it before. And um, uh, I think probably it's a, it's a combination of people in the, uh, in the institution um, itself, in the staff, who, who make some of those decisions. Now, I don't know. I mean, I suspect that Louise is on the call somewhere. I can see she is because she's just asked a question. Um, uh, but she may be able to answer that question. I don't know. Um, but, so the short answer is I don't know. Um, I imagine Tim that you know you as chair would have a say on the the diversity and dispersion uh, you know the nature of the people we have there but uh, I mean it's a big group it's a group of what 20 something people 22 people or something um, and uh, you know for a, a different range at different stages of their career thanks Ian if I if I could just chip in um, so agree with everything you said. I, I personally, I have had conversations with the institution staff, and the conversations are along exactly the lines that you've just said. We we have got to improve our diversity in every aspect of the profession, of our education, of awards, of everything associated with the institution. And so, the big driver in every aspect um, is is to improve diversity year on year on year. So that is a that is a significant driver with some of the discussions which go on, I, just exactly as you said. Yeah. <clears throat> so the next question comes from a PhD candidate who's based at ETH in Zurich, and uh, his name is Konstantinos Vulpiotis. And my apologies, Konstantinos, if I haven't pronounced your surname correctly. Your question is very interesting. He says, "Thank you for this extremely interesting discussion." Will there, stroke, can there be an award that celebrates excellent collaboration between engineers and architects and contractors, etc.? Could could I? So <laughs> I'm slightly conflicted here because this is one of my ex students, <laughs> so, <laughs> who I know very well. Um, could, Tanya, can I ask you to to answer that one, please? Yeah, sure. I'd love to. Um, and I guess I'm just I'm going to give my own personal perspective on this because I don't feel that I know enough to speak for on behalf of all the judges. But here's what I think. So um, in in the slides that I presented, I suggested that the future might be celebrating more collaboration because I think that's the only way we're going to make these real step changes towards addressing climate emergency. Um, and densification of the urban environment. So I think that I think it's really important to consider that. And I think that the awards will reflect um, our values and keep us relevant. And so if collaboration is at the forefront of keeping us relevant and reflecting us as a profession, then I, I can't personally see why that wouldn't be the case. But I would say that I think a lot of um, 
a lot of projects that are award winners already reflect that collaboration. Yeah, and that's exactly. what you see in projects that are successful is that it isn't just one consultant or one part of the design team um, or the construction or the client. Um, award winners typically are projects, whether it's specifically um, outlined or not, that have that successful collaboration between everyone because we know that that you know, you can you can only have a project that um, is successful if you have a team that works together. So I would say that it's there. It's just not currently called out, but it, it might be something we bring to the fore in the future if it becomes more relevant to do so. I don't know if either of the other judges would like to chip in on that. I think well, it's a really interesting question. I, I will, if I may, uh, just to say, I think really just to, to augment what you said, you, you know, yes, it's already there. Um, you know, we look for that collaboration because actually, almost by definition, if a bridge or a structure has been designed for good construction, you know, for good constructability, the chances are there's been good liaison communication between the designer and the contractor. Equally, if there's if a building has had, uh, you know, a good expression of the architect's vision and all the rest of it, there has to be that collaboration. So, it is there, and I think probably you're right. Just about every single one of the successful projects already demonstrate that degree of collaboration. Excellent, thank you. The next one, we only we have time for a couple of more questions. This one is from Margaret Cook, who's a director of Integral Engineering Design. Um, how do you judge a project which results in practically no intervention? Because as judges, that gives you little in the way of pictures and a lot of words explaining the process. That must be very difficult to deal with, she says. I will, I'll take that one, if I may, to start with, um, Don. Um, Margaret, thank you very much for the question. Uh, some some people in the, in the call will know that Margaret is an expert in exactly this area That's right. of, of minimum <laughs> intervention. Um, and this, this is what Margaret specializes in, and I can understand exactly where the question is coming from. This, is, this has been an issue. Uh, so it's correct to flag it. You know, we do need um, imagery. On the evening, uh, it's it's important. It's we 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 want to celebrate what we have done. Um, however, this so in other words, to put this new category in place, this minimal intervention uh, category in place, was not without controversy. But we were adamant that it had to be in place, and the imagery becomes secondary. Um, and it goes back to what Ian was saying earlier in terms of arguing the case. Um, we have got to argue the case why this is special and what the expertise was, which was used to ensure that minimal intervention was possible. Tanya or, or Ian, would you like to add anything to that? No, I think you got, I'd, got it I'd right. Like to, I'd, I'd like to jump in and, and just say from my own experience, doing nothing is almost always more challenging yeah. than doing something. And I think it's a really good question. How do you how do you, you visually convey something you can't see or that you didn't do? Um, but my feeling is that the thinking behind that is immense and yeah. and that that's what needs to be conveyed in the submission. And I and we do have a diverse judging panel, but it is largely engineers with experience. Yeah. Um, and so you know, those judges will understand the message if it's conveyed conveyed in a kind of succinct way. Yeah. Um, that's my feeling with it. Thank you. So I'm going to take three more questions and then we're going to cut off at that point. Uh, this is from our own Louise uh, Tingley. She says, let me see if I can get it up. The, the website says that projects need to be completed in the stated time frame. What exactly do you mean by completed <laughs> in inverted commas? <laughs> Fed with feeling. <laughs> Ian, would you like to start on that one? <laughs> well, I mean, it, it's. I mean, I'm smiling because Louise has asked the question. I mean, but basically, what this is, what she's driving at here is that uh, we, we we do need to be clearer about exactly what we mean by by completed. You know, was it is it open to be used by the public? Let's say. You know, I've got a project now which I'm waiting to submit because a bridge that's been completed a couple of years ago is now out of date for that, but it's not yet open to the public. So does it still count? You know, so I think we need to be clear about that. Um, so um, I'm not sure I know what the answer is, except but my, for myself, I would have said 
practical completion. So under a contract, you know, the project is practical completion. The difficulty then comes when it's part of a bigger project. So if the project that's being submitted for an award is part of a bigger project for which project practical completion has not yet been granted, then we have a problem. You know, my footbridge, let's say, has been completed, but the development that it's part of hasn't been, and therefore it's still not complete. So I think we need to be to be clear about this, but I think it's practical completion of the thing that is being submitted. That's my own view. If, if I could add to that, the, um, the bit which we really are after is we're after far more than structural completion. We are after oh, yes, sure. something which is beyond that point where preferably, of course, the, 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 the project is open and functioning yeah. because, frankly, because of imagery. We want to get the imagery right and, and yeah. see the impact and know what the societal impact has been to be able to judge the award. Um, but Ian is right. There, there is a muddiness. There's often a muddiness in this, particularly with the bigger projects, uh, which is which which we just have to deal with as it comes. Generally speaking, we have conversations with people who are entering things, and we and we smooth things over in terms of conversation. That's generally speaking how it happens. If there's any if there's any um, uh, uncertainty about whether the project should be submitted or not. Thank you. Uh, Chris Shaw asks another question, and I'm going to paraphrase it. Um, I think what he's basically asking here is, do you get entries from sole practitioners and winners as well from that category? Yeah. Tanya, would you like to answer that? Yes, I mean, from from my experience, um, they do tend to be um, more small to medium projects, but there's nothing that says they have to be. Um, and, and when looking for engineering excellence, I, I, I am never really looking at um, who has submitted the award when I first open the package of information on that particular project. I'm looking at how it fulfills the criteria that we're judging against, and then I might look at who it is. Um, and that's not deliberate, that's because I'm most interested in the project. So that's right. uh, we do see it, but certainly um, I'm, not, I'm, I'm focused on the project, not not necessarily who submits it. It's open to everyone. And I think the diversification of categories is trying to really um, ensure that it is accessible in that sense. Yep. Thank you. I'm going to bend the rules slightly and take just two more. So this one is from Edward Malarkey in Dublin. He says, is today's public vote more based on architecture rather than on structural engineering? Okay, I, let me jump in and then allow the other judges to, to say what they think. The, the answer is no, but it, it does require more, um, more judgment from the whoever's looking at the entries online because the, but through necessity, the amount of information that we have given for each project is relatively short. It's just a paragraph of words with imagery. So there's an interpretation side of this clearly, which, which needs to be which needs to be dealt in and, and we're all fully aware of that but but at this point has been made a few times and it needs to be emphasized really nothing to do with the structural awards is architecture by itself by no means yeah. it is an intent of architecture which we're trying to drive that becomes part of the part of the judging process but it is technical excellence that we are really judging and that and in the people's vote i have to admit of course there will be a degree of interpretation which has to be carried out tanya ian well i just emphasize i just agree i mean the, the difficulty is when you've just got photographs of a build, beautiful building or just beautiful photographs which tend to just show you know the architecture it's actually you've got to somehow look beyond that to understand what is what's clever about the structural engineering and in just a photograph you frankly you often can't tell so, so yes, to an, to an extent, the answer is yes. It is slightly not going to, going to give you a, a clearest picture if it's just based on beautiful photographs. We often have this problem. People submit fabulous photographs of beautiful, beautiful buildings, but actually we want to look under the skin. We want to know why is it clever, structural engineering. And so that's where the challenge comes to put that across in the images that you submit. Great. And the, the final question, um, is probably easy enough to answer. Is the panel of judges selected to represent a diverse and inclusive approach to excellence in structural engineering? 
<laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> so, so yes, and I have the wonderful privilege of chairing the of of chairing the jury on the basis that I am an academic, so I have no vested interest whatsoever in uh, in companies winning. Uh, and from there, the diversity side of things is 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 so important to us. The answer is absolutely yes. We have representation from big companies, from small companies. We have architecture representation on the panel. Um, the answer is yes. Mm. Thank you. It's it's probably time now to bring the proceedings to a close, and we've just about managed to stick to the sixty minutes. Um, this is the first time the institution has run a session like this, and what an insightful event it has been. Uh, I certainly found out things I never knew before about the structural awards process. I, I really found it fascinating. So I would like on behalf of you all to thank and congratulate our three panel members, Tanya, Ian and Tim, for presenting to us this evening and for being so forthright in answering the various questions put to you. I, I thought it was great interaction between the three of you. So those of you who form the audience, you can all clap if you wish, but unfortunately <laughs> the panel members won't be able to hear it. Um, thanks also to you, the audience, for your attendance and participation in posing some very relevant questions. Um, what we do hope is that as a result of this session, many more of you, based on what you've heard, will be encouraged and motivated to enter the awards next year and in years to come.